Okay. Thanks everyone once again for joining. You know, I'm so excited to be giving a talk about using open source Python software to develop complex system designs. About 10 years ago, I joined Ford Motor Company as a functional safety engineer, which means I was tasked with designing these complex software-based systems um, and ensure they wouldn't malfunction and cause harm to our customers. So things like uh, people are probably familiar with um, Toyota had issues with unintended acceleration. So we designed kind of this redundancy and functional safety into our systems. So one of my first assignments I had was to help develop this new 10 speed transmission we were working on, and it was incredibly complex. It had like over 40 different ways for the transmission to be in neutral alone. So just neutral. And then it also had 10 other gears. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, we did this hazard analysis on this, and we originally set down and tried to write out all the requirements of the system. And we spent months with some of the experts trying to capture everything and trying to think of all the ways that this really complex system might fail. And we were doing a systems engineering approach, right? We were taking it top down, but it was just too complex to get your head around. And at the end of some of this effort, we weren't very confident in the design that we had really captured everything. And this is kind of that engineering status quo of using documents and trying to manage all those documents to do engineering of complex systems. Go to the next slide. So model-based systems engineering was something some of my colleagues and I at Ford had been experimenting with for small projects. And we thought, hey, maybe we could extend model-based systems engineering and using a language called SysML or systems modeling language and extend it for functional safety as well. And maybe that would help us understand that these really like complex systems better um, and design in the functional safety to them. This project and others were hugely successful. And actually now at Ford, we use uh, MBSC for not just functional safety, but the majority of our features and platform system design for all of our features and platform systems on our new vehicles. And MBSC really improves that rigor we're able to apply to engineering by using this common language that everyone speaks the same way to describe our designs by allowing for this easy abstraction of information and through automated checks for completeness and correctness. So first of all, with a language, SysML provides this open standard for systems modeling and having a common language to describe a system is so important for communication. And it allows us to describe these requirements and designs with precision. For abstraction, it really allows us to see the forest for the trees. For complex systems, I believe that abstraction is the key to understanding and good analysis. You just can't wrap your head around the whole problem for some of these really complex problems we need to solve. And finally, for automation, making something repeatable allows us to put checks in for completeness and correctness as we are developing it. Rapid automated feedback to the engineers designing something helps ensure quality of our designs and really builds in that quality. At Ford, we also, um, as we were rolling out MBSC to more projects, we realized we needed a common way to um, define the projects we were creating. So we developed common abstraction levels. These abstraction levels are um, what problem we're trying to solve at each step. So for example, at the concept level, we define the problem we're trying to solve. The logical level, we create solution agnostic. Uh, we create solutions that are agnostic to the technology choices we're making. At the technology level, we then create solutions using these detailed technical so technical choices, including software and hardware. And then finally, at like an implementation is the actual like built artifact, the actual vehicle that's on a road or something like that. 
SysML actually has four pillars, but I'm going to focus on three. Um, and those three pillars are behavior, structure, and requirements. MBSC allows us to connect those three pillars, the behavior or like the function a system has, the structure or how it takes shape, what its form is, and then the requirements or constraints on the system. And we can connect all three of those to really understand how a system must perform. About five years ago, as we were deploying MBSC at Ford, I looked around and wanted to help spread some of these ideas to more engineers, especially those like in school and training. Unfortunately, all I saw in the ecosystem was really commercial software tools. And we use commercial tools at Ford as well, but often these tools are expensive. They can be slow and complex to use, and it makes this like really high barrier to entry. So if you want to um, teach someone SysML, it's often very difficult to teach them yeah, one of these tools and the language and how to do modeling. I was also really passionate about open source software. So I started looking around and stumbled across a modeling tool that was actually created in 2001 <laughs> by um, a gentleman, Aryan Molinar. Um, but it hadn't been updated in about five years. So I set out on taking this project that was on GitHub and modernizing it. And eventually Aryan joined me as well. And the result of this is we modernized the tool, added capabilities for SysML and RAML and other languages. And I think I've really come quite a long way in creating this very fast open source multi-platform modeling tool for everyone to use. So enough with talking, let's uh, switch gears a little bit and engineer something. You want to share now? Yeah, I'll go ahead and share. Okay. I think everyone can see my screen and there shouldn't be anything on it. I don't actually have Gafor open yet, um, but I'm going to open it now and you can see it popped up immediately. And I'm just verifying everyone can see uh, the modeling tool now, right? We can. Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is kind of the welcome screen Gafor provides, and it has these modeling templates, and we're going to use one to build um, a model together. Um, so in this case, we're going to be using SysML. Sys so I'm going to select um, the SysML template to create a new model. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close these open diagrams here. This is the user interface for Gafor. Um, you can see over here on the left-hand side, um, there's the concept, logical, and technology level, um, as we discussed um, just a moment ago. Um, and then on the left-hand side here is a modeling toolbar. And on the right-hand side, there is a, um, I guess, side panel with configurations for the program. And I am going to stop sharing for just a second because I can't see my mouse for some reason and I can't model without a mouse. So <laughs> let me try again. Okay, I have a mouse now, that's good. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so uh, yeah, so our concept level is then broken down into the three pillars. And the same thing with the logical level, behavior requirements and structure and the technology level. Um, you can select the profile that you're using to model with. So there's UML, SysML, RAML, and C4. And there's also a, a button up here to create a new model or to create a new diagram. Um, so we have the SysML profile selected. The, this package structure is part of that starting SysML model that we created. 
times it to get it. Okay, I see what's going on. Good times it. This has nothing to do with it. And um, like I said, on the right hand side, there's um, some toolbars, and this is how you can like open a new model and create a new model. Okay, so now we have kind of like the yeah, the, the, we have the the model browser. We have like our toolbox here that we can use. This is pretty much all there is to get for. So we're going to start modeling now. We're going to create um, an espresso machine, so a coffee maker. And we're going to go through this um, approach to creating a model using these abstraction layers. And we're going to create some diagrams together. Um, you can download Gafor at gafor.org. It's free and open source. And if anyone wants to download it and try to follow along, yeah, glad to have you do that as well. Um, so I'm going to start at the concept level. And remember, this is how we, this is um, the definition of the problem we want to solve. So in this case, we want to create an espresso machine. Um, so first of all, I'm going to go and start with the behavior. And we have use case diagrams here. Um, and our use case diagram um, has some stuff pre-filled out in this template, but we're going to update this information based on what we're designing. So instead of um, a user, we're going to say the person operating this espresso machine is a barista. Um, and instead of it being called use case one, we're going to make our use case to brew coffee. Um, and you notice um, the use case is associated with this block. So we can also come over here or click on the block and we can call this an espresso machine. So what this is for the use case, what this is telling us is the barista's main goal for using the espresso machine is to brew coffee with it. Seems kind of straightforward, but it's, it's very important to understand like what the the use cases of that feature or system you're building really make sure you understand that um, at this top abstraction level of like what why are we why are we designing this thing we're building so we've um, created this um, use case you notice um, like other sysml tools up in the upper left hand corner it says uc so this is a use case diagram and kind of provides that indication up in the upper left corner so we'll also um and i'll rename this but we can create use case and we can create use case scenarios um so we can create a use case scenario for brew coffee. I would normally create one maybe for each of the use cases if we had multiple ones. Um, so now we wanna kind of go through the steps of um, brewing coffee that we'd use as an espresso machine for. And so once again, this is like a behavior where we're explaining more on how the use case works. Um, using an activity diagram, and that's where this ACT is here up in the upper left. So the first step we would have for this use case um, for a barista to brew coffee is probably like to turn on the machine, something like that. And then the second action is to grind coffee. And then um, because we have this diagram open, you can see that it automatically shows the toolbar and opens it up for um, the, ac the actions or activity types that we're using here. And then there's a general toolbar that has things like comments and a magnet tool and, and other things that are applicable across, um, across projects. Um, so we can add um, another action. Um, or load coffee and filter. Um, you see these like blue lines that come up. Those are for um, centering things in the diagram. You got, if you also hover on any of the act the uh, tools here, they'll tell you what the keyboard shortcut is. So instead of going down and clicking, I could just click the A button and create a new action. Um, 
so now we could um, pull a shot. And then we could serve coffee. Clean up filter and drip tray. And turn off machine. Okay, so um, we could kind of center everything here a little bit if we want to. Um, and then we can connect these with our control flows um, between each one. Um, you notice with Gafor, it had when you create a relationship, when it's connected, they turn red. And then in the middle of it, it also has like a little green arrow. So you can create breaks in the line as well if you want to. And you'll see that later if we need to like create arrowed lines. Um, so we can draw all these or hit Shift F to draw them quicker. Okay, so now we have this use case scenario for brewing coffee. Um, where we've gone through how kind of a barista would, um, you know, go from turning on machine to, to getting the coffee brewed to turning it back off again. Okay, so we've gone kind of done our behavior pillar that we said we we're going to do first. And so remember, this is like the functionality the system has at the concept level, which is where we're defining our problem solution or our, our, our problem itself, the problem we're trying to solve. Um, so next, we'll move over to structure. Notice this says BDD. This is a block definition diagram, um, which is a special type of diagram for structure in SysML. And so now we're defining what this, um, at the concept level, what this espresso machine and the things around it contain. So I'm actually going to call this the domain around it. And um, we're gonna call this the, oops, sorry, clicked the wrong button there. We're gonna rename it and click it, call it the feature structure, um, or we could call it like express machine structure or something like that. So inside our domain around the express machine, we have other things. So there's the express machine itself. We talked about, like there's a barista. Um, we also have maybe coffee itself, coffee beans or something like that, or ground coffee maybe if uh, our express machine doesn't grind the coffee itself. And then we can add more blocks. We can hit shift B. Um, we're gonna need like some type of water source probably for water for brewing the coffee. Uh, maybe we need like a coffee, coffee drinkers or <laughs> some people drinking coffee. Um, we might need like, there might be other things as well, like electricity for the espresso machine and yeah, and other things. So, but I think this is good enough for now. So we've kind of defined this structure around our domain, we're going to use this composite association, which means all these things are part of our domain. Um, and it includes our espresso machine. So we're kind of defining this, um, the environment around the coffee machine and um, yeah, some of the, the other structural elements um, around it. Okay, so that was with a block definition diagram at this concept level. Um, so next we could um, work on requirements. So we did behavior and structure and next we could do requirements. Um, so what we wanna do now is these are kind of our stakeholder requirements or concept level requirements to really define um, once again, the, the problem we're trying to solve and requirements. So based on our use case diagram and structure, we want to um, write requirements or our, uh, yeah, 
our benchmarking, we'd want to be able to write requirements on what, what our coffee machine needs to be at the end. So I think we should make a maybe personal espresso machine that can sit on a counter. And if we're going to do that and put it in my kitchen so I can make some espresso, it needs to um, like get water from a tank instead of being directly hooked up to some type of water source. So maybe we could put a requirement that uh, this espresso machine has uh, and contains a water tank. So this is the requirement object we're creating. Um, so if you double click on the requirement, it creates the title for it. And then um, now we're starting to use this um, right hand side and you can see the ID from the requirements over here. Um, and there's a text for the requirement as well. So we could say the espresso machine. So have a integrated water tank that holds at least two liters or something like that. Okay, so we have like a requirement that our espresso machine is having a has a water tank, um, and maybe we did some more stakeholder analysis, and we just we discuss what consumers really want out of their espresso machine. So we can add a couple other requirements as well. Um, so um, things like um, we want maybe a button on the front of our espresso machine to get one or two um, shots from the machine. Yeah, and there are also a few suggestions in the chat. I don't know if you want to. Great. Incorporate them. So one of the suggestions for the requirements is that the machine shall be portable. And cool. I'm seeing like another one. The machine shall have indicator lights. Cool. I like all of those. And then we can add another requirement, which or we could hit R to add one. Okay, I like all those ideas. Um, More suggestions yeah. incoming. Okay, I like <laughs> this. We're we're uh, group designing this. I love it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we have this one cup button to brew a single shot of espresso. Anything else you wanna add? So the suggestions are self-cleaning. The okay. machine shall have heat, the machine shall heat water to a minimum temperature of X and a maximum temperature of Y and caution hot signs. Oh, the machine shall have a button for extra strong. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, I'll add one more for like serving temperature or something. I like all those though. <laughs> Output coffee at I don't know. Based on our analysis, it needs to be at 98 degrees Celsius to the coffee cup. And we probably need to add some precision there or something, but does that look good, everyone? So we, got, we have some requirements we've added at the concept level. And um, now we've gone through the, the three kind of pillars here. So we have some activities, some 
requirements. And we also showed some quick structure with a domain diagram. Okay, so let's move on to the second abstraction level. So now we can go to a logical level. And this is um, the high level design that is um, technology agnostic. And so now we're starting to define kind of the functionality um, and the um, and this high level design um, as we go. And I saw there was a question online. Hunter, did you want to come off mute and ask a question? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, somebody asked earlier, is, is there a relationship between established behaviors and structures, and I would include requirements, at the concept level within GAFOR? Does it, does it relate them, or is that a conceptual relationship? Um, so you definitely can make relationships. Maybe I, I'll show that a little bit more at the logical level. So I'll create, um, for example, for example, we'll create an activity diagram with swim lanes, and that will create a relationship between um, between our behavior and the the actions and activities and the structure. So there's ways to relate it, just like in SysML. Maybe for this concept level, I'll not make any relations for now. But yeah, just like in normal SysML, you can create um, relations between requirements, structure, and behavior. Um, yeah, to your liking. So. So, so Dan, my, I guess my that was my question. This is Steve Cash. Hey, Steve. Um, it, it was more along the lines of, is the data and the data model underneath Gaffer have relationships to that that represent that? Yeah, it does. It, okay. Yeah, so this just this is not a picture drawing tool. This has a full UML, SysML, RAML data model underneath that's been. Um, it's actually been modeled, the data models, and yep. then that data model has been converted into Python. And so every object we create here is in a data model, and every relationship we make is um, in the model as well. And that's what gets stored in the model file when you save the project. Okay, so traceability then between behavior structure requirements can all be drawn from the the, the data model, not just the drawings. Yep, that's right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so let's move on to the logical level. Could I could I ask a clarifying question? When you're talking about data model, are you meaning in the ERD? I'm, I'm not familiar with what that acronym is. The, Can you? Uh, the entity relationship diagram. Um. Is that a SysML diagram type, or what? What is a? I don't. I'm not familiar with what an entity relationship diagram is. Um, I I think what database people call it is ERA, entity relationship um, attribute type of of data structure. But uh, I think yeah. I think that's I think that's. Your, your diagram you're talking about, the ERD, basically shows entities with a relationship trace between them, right? Um, yeah, and, and, and they have, uh, they map to levels as well. So conceptual, logical, and physical okay. as well. Yeah. If, if you have a reference for that, that'd be good information. Okay. You can put that in the chat. Yeah. Uh, and, um, so so you, yeah, can use yeah. di you can use diagrams to, Put relations between objects. I'm not familiar with that exact diagram type, but yeah, if, uh, yeah, happy to learn more if you want to share information about um, that specific type. But it's it's often common in uh, SysML to have matrices and other things to to map um, different objects to each other, right? Okay, um, so let's head on to um, our logical area. So we are now, once again, defining this high level um, structure behavior and requirements um, for this technology agnostic design. Um, so you can see in our template, there was some um, example logical things in here. So there's a feature sensor controller and actuator. So what we wanna do is update this with the thing we're building. So we have an espresso machine Um, and at a logical level, 
um, independent of the technology. Now we want to define the parts of that espresso machine. So we um, mentioned that our machine is going to have a water tank. Um, we need some type of water heater to heat up the water. And we also need a pump to um, pressurize the heated water. And that's what makes espresso espresso. It, it pressurizes it to nine bar um, and then forces it through the coffee. Um, there's also a Porta filter. So this is the, um, it's, it's a portable filter, but it's the device that holds the coffee that you uh, put the coffee in and then, uh, yeah, um, yeah, put the espresso grounds in and that holds it. And then you put that into the um, espresso machine. Um, so we got water tank, a water heater pump. Um, and then the the place where the porta filter connects is like the head of the espresso machine. Um, I think like at a high level, that's probably pretty good for a probably all espresso machines need to have some parts like this that are included in the machine. So I think that's a good start at least. Um, so once again, we're going to use a composite association to say the espresso machine contains um, the porta filter and the head and the pump and the water heater. I think for our espresso machine, we're not going to have uh, like a steamer for heating up milk because we're going to we're we just like espresso shots, no no cappuccinos or anything. So we'll we'll skip all that. So we're, we're just heating up water pumping it up pressure um, into the coffee grounds and, and making espresso that way. So this, once again, what this represents is this espresso machine contains all of these parts. Um, and what we'll also want to do is update the tail end of these relationships um, because we'll be referencing those later. So if you select the relationship themselves, once again, all the, the options are on this right-hand side. And so we can um, rename our um, relationships here as well to represent um, the part properties for our parts of our machine here. Okay, so we've named our um, composite associations. We have these blocks. So now we have a, a nice, once again, block definition diagram at a logical level of our espresso machine. Next, we could create a logical boundary diagram. So let's do that. So this is an internal block diagram. And this is why it says IBD up in the upper left. And so we're going to use this to show, um, I guess, overall the structure at the logical level um, of how our espresso machine will work. Um, once again, we updated some of these names and we can replace what's in here. This was just an example of like a sensor actuator, a sensor controller actuator, and um, we'll, we'll add some things here as well. You know, one thing I think we probably also need is probably some HMI. <laughs> Um, otherwise it's probably not going to work if we don't have some HMI for the customer to interact with. And also, um, let's also add a controller. So we're going to need something to control the pump and the water heater, and we're going to need some way for the customer to interact with it. So let's add those as well. Okay. And we'll name those. Okay. So we have our logical boundary. Um, so, and, and you can see in here, like these relationships are being built in the model as we go. Um, if we 
expand the espresso machine, you can see that these are now part properties of the espresso machine that were created in the last step. So we can drag them for the ones that don't exist to our diagram. So we're going to need our porta filter here. Bring that in. We need our HMI, our pump, our water heater. Oh, we already had a water heater. Okay, I can get rid of that. Um, water tank. I already had a pump, sorry. And then the head, right? Dan, quick question. Was sure. the uh, logical boundary IBD created off of the espresso machine or is it an independent entity? The espresso machine block. Um, so this is a view of the espresso machine block, yes. But is it uh, is it connected to the espresso machine block in any way? Because you're dragging and dropping the part properties, right? So can you drag and drop a part property of another block? And will that be shown as a reference property in this view? Yeah, it would be. Okay. If we if we add some reference properties. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Grima. Um. So uh, that kind of question was about. If you had things that weren't part of the espresso machine, um, I don't know, like the coffee itself, you could drag um, that into this diagram and then it would be like a dashed line around the property because it'd be a reference property instead of a part property. Because um, the coffee is not part of the machine itself, but we're making use of it or something like that, right? Okay. Um, so... I guess we have our part properties here and now we can start um, connecting them up. So um, we have our water tank, we have a water heater. We need a controller in here. And instead of sense data, so this has an item flow and maybe we just need water to flow into our water heater. And I'm thinking probably, we probably want the pump on the other side. So let's connect the water over to the pump and disconnect the pump from there. And rearrange stuff a little bit. Um, and then let's add our flow back on. So we have water. And this button reverses the arrow because we want the water flow from the tank to the pump. And then we're going to put um, a water heater here in place. And so the pump's going to feed water into the water heater. And we'll add an item flow for that as well. So this is like pressurized water now. Okay, and then we'll switch directions for there as well. Um, so we probably want the water to eventually go through the head there and the porta filter, and we need the controller to control the pump and um, the water heater. So I'm gonna use a connector to make a connection between um, the controller and the pump. We could use proxy ports, um, we support that as well. Um, for, for this at a logical level, I think I'm just going to go without them for now um, to keep things a little simple, but you could add proxy ports to your to them to, to show like the inlet and outlet and we'll oh, we'll make our line right angle. Um, so a controller maybe wants to command pressure. And and temperature maybe okay um and we also need the HMI and that will talk to the controller 
And maybe we're doing, I don't know, these are can turn on and off. We said there was like a one cup button or something as well. So we could add requests from the HMI to the controller as well. Um, and then the water heater will send uh so this is gonna be like hot pressurized water or something. And to the port of filter, then we're going to mix the hot water under pressure with a coffee. And maybe, yeah, maybe we'll call this our coffee mixture or something. Um, and then, yeah, out of the port of filter, we'll we'll have our coffee itself. So this is just like a internal block diagram showing, um, and, and maybe we would also want to add some like feedback, probably, right? So the controller probably need needs to know what the water temperature is. Um, so yeah, we could keep adding additional things to our internal block diagram. So this is like the feedback loop, right? Um, and, and we can use this to see like at a structural view, how is our components that we said are in our logical structure here? We said these are the components and now we're showing how they're connected to each other um, using these item flows between them. Is there any more questions in chat, Grima, so far? Dan, can you flip yeah. back to the logical structure real quick? Sure. Okay, espresso machine. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Dan, there are a few questions. I am flagging them, so I don't know if you want to go through the list. They're not specific to this diagram, but general questions. So do you okay. want to address them towards the end or just? Yeah, that sounds good. We can circle back at the end. Okay. I like that. Thanks, Grima. Um, okay, so now we said we wanted to connect our behavior and our structure together. Well, we haven't drawn any um, behavior. Um, so we're going to do an activity diagram again. I'm actually going to just remove it this time. Um, and so down here for activity diagram, you can create what's called a swim lane. And these swim lanes are partitions where we can say a bit of functionality um, is associated with some structure. And we're gonna need more swim lanes. So I come over here and create a few swim lanes. Um, and so we wanna describe the behavior of the machine now. So for this first one, um, In these allocated types here, you can see the same types we were using elsewhere. So it's pulling in those same like logical types, right? So we could make swim lane, I just um, clicked off it. We could make that the HMI um, and maybe we'll add the other swim lanes as we go on what those are. Um, um, so we're gonna add a, action again to our swim lane. The swim lanes turn blue when you're hovering over it with an action because um, the action gets associated inside the swim lane. Um, and so we should use like a verb here and this is us defining the behavior um, that the HMI will have. So like, I guess we wanna receive barista input or something. So this is our input from the barista controlling the machine. Um, and then we also have input and output pins on our actions. So I will add output pins as we go and also make these a little bit better, um, a little bit bigger. Um, so our HMI then probably needs to go to somewhere from uh, the controller, right? Because that was kind of the flow we had in the other diagram that our HMI was connected to that. So let's call this the controller and we're allocated to the controller block. And we'll add an activity 
to there. And our controller is going to command heat and pressure. And we'll create an input pin. Let me make so it's just a little bit bigger. And OK, so then we can also use, I'm going to use object flows between these and connect them to the pins. So we have this behavior to receive a barista input, and then we command heat and pressure. And so our next swim lanes are probably going to be, well, heat and pressure, probably. <laughs> then, uh, yeah. does it matter that there's no activity start node in this diagram, or do we just miss it? Um, so we could definitely add one. So if we if we want to add a start node and say, hey, our uh, uh, we start by receiving barista input, we can do that for sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so yeah, we can command heat and pressure here. Um, and okay, so. This is our third swim lane. So maybe we'll make the third one, um, the heater, the fourth one, the pump, and we'll allocate them to um, the water heater and to our pump. Okay, and then um, we'll create more of our actions here, give them input and output pins. Um, so we'll, oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. We'll connect those up. I guess the purpose of the water heater is to heat water. Purpose of this is probably to Pressurize water. And make this a little bit bigger. My output pin got disconnected here. Okay. Okay, so we're heating up the water, pressurizing the water. We probably also, um, for both of these, we probably also need some like water input to them, right? So if we had some, um, an input node, input pin on here and an input pin here, And I think, you know, it'd probably be more clear now that we're drawing this if the water was just flowing through and like the commands came um, maybe from the side now that we're drawing this. So that's okay. Let's uh, let's redraw this a little bit. So we'll make our water come in directly. So let's say this is our water coming in. And we should probably should have even created a wa water tank swim lane, but maybe we'll we'll skip our water tank for now if everyone's okay with that. But if we had a water tank, um, our water would be coming from that tank. And then we could add our commands. I think this would be a little bit more clear. Okay, so um, and if we wanted to, we could like name our pins. So um, 
and yes, line up everything and stuff. But yeah, we could like name our pins or add guards and stuff. Um, but yeah, we could call this um, yeah, so we could oops, man. So we could like give these names if we want as well. Um so I I think everyone maybe gets the gist of creating an activity diagram. I guess we could make this really fast the head given that just a quick, but go ahead. Just a quick question is the the logical boundary diagram has these elements in it. Hmm. And your then your activity diagram has the 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 same information. Mm -hmm. Is is there a way to make sure that those are consistent? Um, so the, so the question is about consistency. So the logical structure here, these blocks, the, the uh, boundary, I'm sorry, the, if you go to your bound logical boundary, yep, you have your pressurized water, your command temp, right? Oh, yeah. I'll you use the command temp and the command pressure. Now you go to your activity diagram and you have a pressure command, pressurized command. Yep. I'm um, so, wondered. yeah, it's definitely possible. Like we could um, add, uh, I guess in the, the structural view, their item flows. And here I'm, uh, I, we could type the pin so that they have the same type of, information going through them so that's definitely possible um i think that's getting uh important and possible but it's getting maybe a little advanced so maybe we'll skip that today but yeah i mean you can that's fine dan i just wondered if it can be done if yeah. you, okay thanks yeah and the yeah and kind of the the typing aspects as part of sysml right so okay exactly um so the head, maybe the purpose of this is to mix water and coffee, something like that, or direct water over coffee. <laughs> okay, and then um, I'll look at a type of this was a porta filter. And we could add a couple more pins. So like an output pin here. We could add an input pin. We could add more small, more object flows. And then I think the purpose of a porta filter is to retain coffee grounds, maybe. So they don't go into your espresso. Okay, so then. We're going to connect these together. We could name some of our flows um, if we need to, but you can kind of see, hey, this is the general. Now we're talking about behavior. These are all verbs on what each block's behavior is going to provide. So the water heater is going to heat the water. The controller is going to command heat and pressure. But now this is kind of a behavior view. And oh, by the way, we have linked the behavior this received barista input to this block called HMI and the controller command heat and pressure. We have we have um, created this relationship between the controller and that activity by drawing it like this in the swim lanes. So that's one way to connect like your behavior to your to your structure of your system. Okay. Um, other things we could do for behavior at the logical level, like we could create a, a state machine with logical states. I think for time, we'll probably skip that, but that's definitely possible as well. So we've created um, two structural diagrams. We've created our functional boundary diagram, um, and then we could also create some requirements. Um, if we go back to our concept requirements, we probably want to derive some requirements from those. So we could add those to this diagram as well. Um, so we had things like uh, the water tank contains the water tank here. So we could add that here. Um, we had stuff about 
serving temperature. We don't need to add all the all the uh, diagram, all the requirements here, but um, we could add a couple of them. Okay, um, everyone was really into writing requirements before, <laughs> but uh, so we contain a water tank and we also have a serving temperature and maybe there, let's add like one more, like there's this one cup button. So these requirements now, they're supposed to be agnostic to the technology, but we're supposed to be at this top level design now, right? So we're not just defining the problem, but we're helping design it. So in order to say, create an espresso using this one cup button, um, we need to control pressure. So the espresso machine shall control pressure to 900 kilopascals. Okay, and that's um, that's equivalent to nine bar, which is the pressure that espresso machines use. And then we can use this D relationship here for derive or hit shift D, and we can derive that requirement from the concept level one. Um, so in order to for this one cup button to brew a single shot, we need to be able to control pressure to 900 kilopascals. Um, okay. Um, any other uh, requirements in chat that anyone wants to add? <laughs> Or unmute yourself and say them out loud. <laughs> Hi, this is Tina. Do we have something that involves a state yet? Um, so I kind of, uh, I, I didn't show it, but we do support, obviously you'd want something more than on, on off state, but um, you can imagine you can, you can develop a state machine here. You can nest um states under this state and so like we could have a i don't know heating state or something so i i didn't i didn't go into this but we can develop state machines as here here as well maybe there's a brewing state right so then you can create transitions between them and develop a state machine as well at the logical level okay and the reason I ask is is because um, often there are allowed actions um, or allowed users associated with particular states, and I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how we how we illustrate that here. Mm, allowed users or actions. Um. So. Um. I guess the way I'm used to seeing that in state machines is you see in these brackets, we have added a guard. Um, so if we were looking for a certain input or a certain thing to happen in event for us to make a transition, so hey, the user has to press the one cup button or something like that, then we could add a guard for that and that would guard the transition to the next state. And so, for example, the HMI would have a turn on and turn off button, and that guards our transition into the off to on state. Okay. Um, so if if the um, yeah, just trying to understand it, if this if there's anything that ties from the state diagram back to requirements, just for requirements traceability purposes, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so we can make relationships between all the elements. And if we had a, I don't know, the system shall have a heating state, then we could create a requirement for that. And um, uh, often you use things between like behavior, like, hey, this behavior is um, refining the relationship or the structure like satisfying. So you can um, create relationships to those elements um to to show that um the behavior or structure helped develop that requirement okay thanks for that question tina thanks Ian. so 
so Dan, as you were saying there, so you could bring the pump in and say the pump is in the control are here to satisfy that requirement? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we wanted to, I mean, yeah, we, we, yeah, we can bring the pump into a diagram and make a relationship between the pump and the, okay. and the requirement, right? Or maybe should this be the other way? I think it's the other way in system. Yeah. Yep. There you go. We have said the pump satisfies the control pressure requirement. So, okay. Um, and once again, this is creating that relationship in this underlying data model. So it means a real thing. It's not just a picture. Um, so we could add more requirements. So like control temperature, because we had a requirement up here for that. So the espresso machine shall control temperature um, to the sub point temperature. I'm not sure what that would be. Probably that's to be calibrated to get the right coffee temperature, but um, we could have drive that from the, the one above, right? And maybe instead of the express machine down here, it'd probably be a little better to say, hey, we were saying the controller should do this, right? That was our logical element and same over here. Okay, so we've created a couple of requirements derived from the concept requirements. We have developed at the logical level, um, a functional boundary behavior. Um, I showed briefly what state machine might look like um, and also the logical structure and boundary diagram at the logical level. So now we have this kind of technology um, agnostic view of our design. Um, next step, we would actually go at, from the logical level and we do something very similar, the exact same three pillars, behavior, requirement, structure. And instead of drawing a logical level structure, we would draw the actual components we're going to use in our espresso to meet those requirements. And then we would draw much more um, detailed behavior and state machines and activity flows of how the controller is going to control um, temperature and pressure, and then um, develop that next level down of requirements. So it's very similar to the logical level, um, just at that next uh, next level down. And due to time, I think we will skip uh, skip adding any more diagrams from the technology level. Um, was there any questions? Dan, there are a bunch of questions in the chat. So maybe we can start with those and then take more questions uh, depending on time. Great, that sounds good. Yeah. So one of the questions was, do you use Gafor at Ford? And I replied to that saying, we you primarily use Magic Draw? I am unaware of any applications of Gafor, but you can clarify. Yeah, that's right. This is kind of uh, Dan's free time uh, developing <laughs> open source tools. So we do use Magic Draw at Ford, but um, I think it is really powerful having kind of this open source tool that starts up immediately and is quick to draw with and um, it's accessible by everyone. Another question was uh, that also got some answers from the community. Do you have digestible resources for users who are new to SysML? So uh, systems engineering with SysML, UML by Tim Wilkins was mentioned, uh, the book by Deligari, and then Sandy Friedenthal's book was also mentioned. Are there any sources you want to add on top of those? No, I think those are all uh, really good references. Those are kind of the big three, so yeah. 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 Okay. Next question by Brad Acheson. What is available in Gafor that isn't available in proprietary software? Conversely, what are we missing by using Gafor? Um. Can you ask that again, Grima? I didn't quite understand that. What is available in Gafor that isn't available in proprietary software? Conversely, okay. what are we missing by using Gafor? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what 
what is there that's not available? Um, so it's open source. So one cool thing is um, you can write your own plugins or even contribute and make um, the modeling tool better. And I think that's like a huge power and it's written in Python. So it's pretty accessible, um, especially for all you Michigan Python folks. But um, really I, I learned Python to work on this, right? I was not like a professional programmer or something. Um, so I think that's uh, uh, very cool. Um, maybe unique things is like Gafor uses CSS to, to color and customize um, diagrams instead of like drag and dropping colors. So you can like make consistent colors for all your diagrams, um, which is kind of unique. I think I don't, I haven't seen any other modeling tools use like a little bit of CSS to, to customize all the colors and stuff. Um, we also recently, this is like brand new. Um, so like a lot of the commercial modeling tools use like a collaboration server. We don't have something like that. So that's maybe something missing, but on the other hand, you can commit your model to, um, Git or GitHub. And then, um, We've been adding functionality just recently that allows you to merge changes. Um, so if you had two people working on the same project and you wanted to merge your changes together, you can use um, normal like Git source, co source code um, version control to merge the changes together. And I think that's a little bit unique. Um, a lot of times it can be very hard to merge changes um, with some of the commercial modeling tools. A lot of them use like locks and stuff to manage um, revision control. Um, yeah, maybe those are some cool aspects, I guess. It's much, much faster than a lot of the uh, commercial tools. Um, what I mean, what's missing is, you know, like a tool like say Magic Draw, uh, has uh, many, many, many man years of development into it. And it fully supports all of SysML and UML and those specifications. I think we are pretty far along in supporting a lot of them. Um, you can do most things that I would do in there, but um, it, it definitely, if you were like, hey, is go for 100% compliant with all you know, 350 pages of UML and all of SysML, I would definitely say, no, it's not, not all of it um, because those are very complex standards, but it, it meets most of it. And also, I guess we'd like to start implementing SysML version two as well. And maybe we could do that pretty quick um, compared to some of the commercial tools. Okay, so thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks for the question. That's a good one. Next question, can you export models from Gafor to import into other models or into other tools? Um, so if you go to the hamburger menu here and go to export, um, so we have our export to other tools besides um, you can export in image formats is to an XMI. This is that XML interchange format. So it might be possible to import them into other tools. Um, I know someone was testing that recently. Um, I'm not sure what their tool they were trying to um, import into. And I think they had like class type diagrams working, um, but maybe some of the other diagrams weren't. So there's probably an opportunity to improve the, the XMI format as well. Thank you. Next question. So this is similar to the question that you already answered about what uh, what are the features of Gafor compared to other tools. So I think that's answered. Tina, if you have any additional uh, anything additional to add to that, please feel free to speak up. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I may have missed this, but um, can you import specific um, domains, uh, more uh, domain specific um, um, types of, of um, what am I thinking of, of objects for a lack of a better word, but um, the types of like flows and, and objects that uh, you can use in here. Uh, sometimes there's um, some domain specific things that people like to um, customize their tools with. Um, so you, so if you go to the UML profile, um, 
you can use um, meta classes and profiles and stereotypes. So you could develop, and I mean, this is how we code the data model as well, is you, you could create your own types and stereotypes. Yeah. Um, that, that's possible. Okay. It's it's not set up right now very well with like, hey, I have this profile, like some of the commercial tools, like have this separate profile that then you could add into all your models. We're not really set up like that right now. But I mean, it it's also open source. So you can even create your own profile for the drop down if you wanted to. That's how we added C4 and SysML and RAML and those things, right? Uh, so if there okay. is something that's like very... I don't know, some like modeling language you want to add, it's definitely possible. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tina. So there's another question from Tina in the chat, so I'll read that out. Overall, these tools and concepts are very helpful to ensure what is being built at, is as expected. However, the challenge everywhere comes with keeping updated over time and scaling for working with many team members and across teams and organizations. Do you have any experiences or best practices you'd like to share? Um, so if, if you're going to, yeah, I think what we've seen is if you're going to use like MBSC, then it's really important that the model becomes the source of truth of the development. Um, if it's Hey, people are still off doing that status quo document management, and then someone on the side is trying to keep a model updated, then it becomes very hard um, to keep the model relevant. So making the model your source of truth and de generating your documents from your model, um, if you need to generate documents, uh, I think is really important. Um, I, I think we already kind of touched on a little bit of like the collaboration. So some of the commercial tools have like model collaboration. So multiple people can be working on them at once or web views, or I mentioned you can use Git and source control with Go4. So I think all those types of things help with collaboration a lot so that you know, multiple engineers working on the same model. Thanks, Dan. Next question by Emma. Uh, is there a way to define parametric diagrams in Go4? Um, right now, it's not parametrics are not supported. Um, I don't personally use parametric diagrams too much in my modeling, um, and that's probably why they're not supported yet. But if someone really likes parametric diagrams and wants to help us implement them, that'd be great. So, yeah. Next question by Gael. Can we add libraries or information from other modeling projects in Gafor? Is it compatible with another SysML software? Um, so it's, uh, th there's no like integration between Gafor and other tools besides like the XMI export. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about like libraries or profiles. Um, you can build your own types in the model, but that's probably like an enhancement to share those profiles across your models. Uh, we don't have a way to do that besides um, adding in your own profile, like these ones up here. Okay, thank you. Next question is by Tina. Uh, does Gafor generate any code or pseudocode? Um, it does not. There are Python tools um, that can generate code from like class diagrams. And I guess we are generating Python from the before diagrams. That's how the data model is generated. But we don't currently support like a way for you to draw up a class diagram or something and generate code out of it or, or something like that. And and that's uh, some somewhat on purpose because like we're mostly are using this to design things in a descriptive way, not necessarily to like auto code um, a project or something like that. So that just it really hasn't been our focus right now. Okay. It's definitely possible though. Thank you. Uh, next question by Pramesh. In what way is Gafford different from Rhapsody? Um, I, I think we kind of already hit on that. So Rhapsody is one of the yeah major commercial tools. And um, yeah, I think we already hit on some of the main differences between, you know, this is uh, 
very fast to load, pretty lightweight, maybe a lot less options, fairly easy to use, but doesn't have, um, once again, as many options and probably the full support for um, the modeling standards that some of those commercial tools have. But yeah, we'd love to have your support yeah. getting closer to, to, to that, so. <laughs> Next question by Joe. Uh, does Gafor allow for table and matrix views like allocation table views, et cetera? Um, currently, we do not have a table diagram type. It's been on my list of things I would like to implement. And I actually started it because I want one for a hazard analysis and risk assessment. And I actually started implementing that. Um, it's been on my maybe list of things I'd like to finish. But right now, um, the diagrams are the main way to make the relationships and there's not like a table view, but I, I agree that would be a nice enhancement. Yeah. Uh, you might have already answered this or something similar. Uh, so there's a question by Richard. Is there a code generator to create Python classes? Uh, yeah, I think we already answered that. Yep. There's okay. There's not right now. <laughs> Next question by Gael. Uh, does the four support user interface diagrams? Um, I'm not sure if, so I, I don't think a user interface diagram is a SysML diagram type. Um, I guess you could show behavior or structure of a user interface um, using UML or SysML constructs, but we don't have a specific like yeah, user interface builder profile or something like that. Next question by Steve Cash. Uh, how deeply have you looked at SysML version two? Um, we're starting to look at it. I was looking at uh, the kernel ML, the cur ML, and uh, it's it's big. <laughs> uh, it's it's called a kernel, but it's like uh, I think the specification is like 150 pages. Um, and it looks like maybe the first step is to um, RML, um develops its own kind of uh, language, right? That it pro provides that core of the the um, the kernel, uh, yeah, the kernel itself. And so, um, in order to create a data model from that, then I need to create a custom language processor of that language into into Python. So that would be like the next step, I think, of starting to develop the core of um, SysML version two, because it no longer is built on UML. So we need to kind of be able to process that new. Yeah, and and I asked because I've, I've looked at it as well, and it's a significant tear up of SysML. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's not like a, yeah, it's not building on what's here already, but uh, it's definitely, it, it's going to be some work, but it's definitely possible. It, it's exciting as well. So sounds like yeah, a fun challenge. There's even a question of whether BDDs will even be around anymore. Yeah. Thanks, I've never Steve. had to build like a programming language like Lex or Parser though. So that sounds kind of fun. I don't know. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so this question, next question might be to the general systems engineering community or in COSI members. So is LEF MEP, which stands for Lean Enablers for Managing Engineering Programs or LEF SC still being worked on by INCOSI? The website for INCOSI Lean Systems Engineering Working Group doesn't show much. Does anybody have any knowledge on this? No, but Karima, I think we should take that as an action as the NCOSI chapter to go get some status and provide that at the next NCOSI chapter I meeting. Yep, I agree. I will take a note of this. Thank you, Amin. We are also in the process of like a website upgrade across NCOSI International. So where a lot of our websites are currently under construction for that. Yeah, that might be the case. Okay, uh, there's a comment. Okay, so I guess everybody's thanking you, Dan. I don't, there are no more comments in the chat, but Brad says he has been looking at, looking for a low cost software to learn MBSE for a few years now. So thank you, I will be downloading. And if only 
used to learn SSML and MBSE, you've helped. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions from the audience that's still online? Please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. This has been great. And thank you mostly to Dan. Uh, this was a very informative session. Uh, I think everybody benefited from it. And it was a very interactive session, I would say. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, please, everybody else, keep joining our future sessions. And uh, the survey, uh, just as a correction, it has not been sent out via email yet to our membership. It has been posted on LinkedIn. Uh, and Twitter, so you can follow, you can take the survey there, but we will be sending it out to the members via email as well. So send your suggestions. If you if you know of any speakers that would like to come and talk to the chapter, we would be open to those as well. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you in our follow-up events. Please come to the in-person events and also join our virtual events. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good night. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Karima. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for joining, and see you at Michigan Python next month as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye.